Well, if you have your Bible this morning, I'll ask you to go ahead and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 1. And today I want to look at verses 19 through 23. We have been looking at this prayer that Paul has been praying for the Ephesians. Uh, really, we've been looking at this whole book. We spent, I was looking, I think this is the 19th message in chapter 1. Um, honestly, looking at verses 19 through 23, I can easily see three or four messages that are there. And um, there's so much. I'm, I'm overwhelmed just how Paul has written this um, letter to the Ephesians. And I, I hope that you have been encouraged in this study. I know it, for me it has been uh, quite a blessing. I come to this uh, this morning, and I've just been overwhelmed this week at how encouraged I have been by this particular um, prayer that Paul is praying. And I say prayer, I mean, he's been praying for the Ephesians. We saw that uh, a few weeks ago that uh, he makes mention of them. He never ceases to make mention for them in his prayers. He's constantly praying for these Ephesians believers. And, and we know that uh, we've talked about in the beginning of our study that this is uh, probably a circular letter, and so it's not just the Ephesians, uh, it's the other believers in that area in Asia Minor. Um, certainly, it would include us as well. But this is a prayer that as we've been studying, this is how we ought to be praying for others. Um, certainly, we should be praying for our brothers and sisters, what we see in the Scripture, and I think this is a prayer that we ought to pray for ourselves as well. Uh, Paul has been praying. He never ceases to give thanks for them. Um, he's witnessed uh, what he's heard this report about their uh, faith in, in Christ and their love for the saints. And, and he prays for them. And notice what he prays in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give them a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. In other words, as verse 18 continues, uh, since their hearts have been enlightened by the Holy Spirit, uh, Paul doesn't stop there. He's praying that, they, that the Holy Spirit would grant them wisdom and revelation. That is to say that the Holy Spirit would give them insight and, um, and an availing of the knowledge of God. And I just want to pause here again. I know we emphasized this earlier, but this is really um, the goal of the Christian life is to know God. Uh, Jesus, in John 17, 3, when he is praying on behalf of us, uh, he prays on behalf of those whom the Lord has entrusted him, um, God has given him, but he's also praying on our behalf as well, not for the world, but he prays for us, and he prays and he tells us that eternal life is this, that we would know uh, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. And really, that's what this Christian life is about, is, is knowing God. And we emphasized a few weeks ago that it's not uh, simply knowing about God, but it is knowing God. And so it's, this knowledge is an experiential knowledge. Uh, but I, I feel the need, before we move into this this morning, just to kind of emphasize something that I'm not saying this morning. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a knowledge of God. I'm not saying that. Uh, in fact, I would say that we, we need to know, when we look at the Scriptures, and certainly as we think about this letter and the other epistles that are written throughout the New Testament, uh, they're written to common, everyday people like us. To be clear, they're written to believers, but they're written to folks like us. And so we, we should spend our time in the Scriptures, uh, studying the doctrines, studying these great truths, and it's those great truths that give us understanding about our experiences. Uh, to paraphrase what Martin Lloyd-Jones says, that the, um, that the objective is uh, interpreted by the subject, or excuse me, that the subjective is interpreted by the objective. And in other words, it's these truths, the doctrines, that we can interpret our experiences. 
And so we, when we think about the Christian life, we think uh, too many people today have put such an emphasis on, uh, on music. And, I, and you know, I, I love music. I love worshiping. Uh, but a lot of people have the idea that that is the extent of worship. But true worship is rooted in truth. It is knowledge. It is knowing God. And it's out of this knowledge of God that we can understand who we are in Christ, but we understand our experiences, we begin to interpret our lives. It informs our minds on how we should live, but it very clearly gives us an understanding of who God is. So I, I know that's somewhat um, lofty thoughts when we think about those kind of things, but th that's important for us to understand that doctrine is not something that should be put by the wayside. It ought to be first in our life. We ought to be spending time <clears throat> in the Scriptures. And this is what, what Paul is praying for, that they would know God. And apart from the Scriptures, we cannot know Him. Apart from the Spirit enabling us to understand, we cannot know God. And that's what Paul is praying for. Having been enlightened, he prays that God would give them a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. So, God would begin to inform them, begin to uh, enlighten them. And he prays for, in praying for this knowledge of God, uh, there are three things that come out of this that he wants them to know. The three watts is what we emphasized last time. And you'll find them in verse number 18. What is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And we looked at those two last time. And now, beginning in verse number 19, he prays for this third thing that they would come to understand. And that is, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, oh God, we know that there is none like you. And we have come this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray, Lord, that you, having enlightened our hearts, would give us a wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you this morning, that we would be encouraged through this message, that we would be edified through this message, that we would be changed and transformed in our minds and in our lives by the power of God. This we ask for the glory of Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Well, Paul has been praying this prayer for these Ephesians, and he spent a little bit of time on the calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. But as we have just read, the bulk of what he's praying for is in verse number 19 where he begins to pray for the power, the, the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. And, and really, you can see as he begins to pray this that these other thoughts come out of that. Just have a simple outline this morning. And what I want to emphasize this morning is that beginning in verse number 9, uh, what we see there is a description of the greatness of God's power. And then you see a demonstration of that in verses 21 or verses 20 through 23. And so I, I just want to uh, spend our time looking at uh, this first part in verse number 19. We emphasized a little bit this last week. I was preaching uh, mainly on the hope of his calling and the glory of his inheritance last week. Uh, I, I had a natural close there that I, that I really should have ended before I got into the power. But sometimes, sometimes as you're preaching, uh, you just can't help yourself. I and mean, you just want to push on. You want to go on to the next part. And I know 
Um, as I was thinking about that, I, sometimes on Sunday afternoon, I, I beat myself up, and I'm thinking, you know, I should have stopped right there. And the reason I say that I should have stopped is not that you couldn't receive what I was saying, but because there's so much more to be brought out in that passage. I feel like that I just gave you uh, just kind of a taste last week. And rather than go back and really fill in all that we said last week, I just want to kind of give you a brief overview of that description that's there in verse number 19. We mentioned last time that Paul, as he's praying for this, uh, that he actually has four words. He uses four different Greek synonyms to emphasize the greatness of his power. And notice in verse number 19, he says, what is the surpassing greatness of his power? That word is dunamis in the Greek. Uh, we get the word dynamite from that. It speaks about this power that is from God, this, this surpassing greatness of his power, that it's for the Christian, it's for the believer, those who believe, and those alone. And these are in accordance with the working, and that's another word for power. This is where we emphasized last time that this working actually could be translated. Uh, it's a word, uh, energia. It's a word that we would translate energy. Slow down, Pastor. I, I, want, I want us to get here. In other, in other words, what Paul is saying as he's beginning, he's using different words. I mean, he's just piling word upon word. And I'll say this that Paul uses four different synonyms here for power, but the reality is when you're talking about God's power, there are not enough words. And we can't adequately describe it. I mean, this is, a, this is a powerful statement that Paul makes here. And he's trying to emphasize the power of God, but the reality is, is that we cannot really describe the power of God. And so Paul uses these words, and, and the Greek helps us with that understanding that there's, there's different words that are be, being used here so that we can, he can emphasize uh, different parts or different aspects, if you will, of the power of God. So when he's talking about energy, where he says the working, as he puts it, the working of the strength of his might. When you think about the word energy, you think about something that is active, and this is what Paul is emphasizing, that this, this power of God is at work in us. It's an active work. As we think about the power of God, uh, especially in terms of salvation, you know, really, you can sum it up this way, that, two pe that most people really fall in one or two camps when it comes to salvation. They believe that when you speak about the power of God, that really, that what you're talking about is us plus power. In other words, what some people have an idea about is that when it comes to the power of God, it, 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 there's, there's this available power that comes from God, but we have to do something to help that out. And, and so we have to assist God. We have to do something on our part. The other side of that is, and what we believe, and certainly the New Testament Scriptures teach, is that this working, this energy, is God himself doing this. And so, in reality, and this is where we see why he illustrates the, the things the way that he does, and we'll emphasize that in a moment, is that it is all of God doing this work. It is the energy that comes from God. And that's what Paul emphasizes in verse number 19, that his power toward us who believe that these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. And, and you see in that, that all of this is God who is at work. So the energy is what is translated from working of the strength, and we talked about that last time, that strength speaks about a power that, that cannot be, uh, or a power that overcomes, a power that cannot be stopped. And his might emphasizes where this power comes from. In other words, how does, what is he saying here? This is what he's saying. Paul is saying that he wants us to know what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us believe, who believe. And it's in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. So the working is this energy, and this energy has a strength that is a power that cannot be resisted. And where does this power come from? It comes from God. 
and that's what he's, that's what he's emphasizing. That this, this, this power that's at work in us is a power that is from God, and it is a power that cannot be resisted. Now, if you were waiting for a place to say, man, I'm telling you, that was it. I mean, that, that was a good place. Because what, what this emphasizes is that this is God who is doing this work in us. And, and this is what Paul is praying for, that we would understand this work that is in us. The way that this is translated, uh, and, and most of the versions translate it this way, it almost appears that it's a power toward us who believe. It almost appears that it's, that it's something that happens to us or something that we can gain. And, and that's why some people have the understanding that, that this power is something that we pray for, that we need to pray that God would give us this power. But really the way that it's better translated and the way that it's constructed in the Greek is that this is a power that's at work in us. Now what does that make a difference? Because what Paul is emphasizing is this mighty work of God that is in us. This, this power, that, this energy, this power that is active, this power that is working cannot be resisted. It will accomplish what God has intended for it to accomplish. And when I think about my own salvation, I find great comfort that it is God who is at work in me to do as he wills. I find great comfort knowing that this salvation that I have, that it is totally contingent and reliant upon the working of God's power in me to bring it about. Because as I look at my life, and I think about my, my own weaknesses, my own frailties, I look at my, my flesh and the difficulties that I struggle with in the flesh, I look at, at times where I'm, I'm so easily distracted and, and carried away by the lust of this world, and, and I look at my flesh and I think, I'm never going to make it. I mean, you know, I, mean I, I want to do right, I, I want to pursue God, I want to, to live for Him, but there are times when I look at my life and I think, how can I ever make it? I mean, I look at my life and I think, I'm thankful for where God has brought me, but I, but I begin to look at it and I'm thinking, I'm so disappointed that I'm not further along. And, and, and as, I, as I think about that, I think about uh, certainly the, the flesh. I think about this world and the world system and how easily that I can be caught up in the things of this world. How I can be so excited and caught up in a football game. Y'all doing all right this morning? And, and, and really, really caught up in, 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 and I'm not saying football's bad. Please don't hear me say that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that it can be. That, it, that, if, it, that if it begins to, to get my attention in such a way and, and lure me away and pull me away from my Lord, then it can be a bad thing. Anything can, can be a bad thing. Even good things can be a bad thing. Your family, which is a good thing, can be a bad thing if it's not put in the right order. Christ is preeminent. God has to be first. And I look at the world system, and, and you know, I, we've, got, we've got to make a living. We've got bills coming. We've got, you know, electric bill, water bill. All this is coming, and it's so, easily to, it's so easy to, to get distracted by these things and get caught up in the world system. And then, and then you throw the, the devil into it. I mean, uh, you read the scripture and he's like a, a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we think about all of these principalities, that, these powers that Paul is going to talk to us about in chapter 6. I mean, it's really somewhat disappointing. It, it, it's, if, if, we, if we begin to look at all of that, I, I think about what Paul is praying in Romans chapter 7. I mean, the thing that I want to do, I, I don't do, and the thing I don't want to do, I do. I, I think about all of that. And if, I, and if I focus on that, then I can become very discouraged. It's easy to be discouraged. 
And this is where Paul is praying that we would know God and that we would know the power of God. And what Paul is emphasizing is get your eyes off yourself and put your eyes on Jesus. Look at him. Look at God. And look at this one who has began this good work in us, and he is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Look, look, look at him. The author and the perfecter of our faith. The one that will finish this work. Look at Christ. And that's what Paul is praying. Look at him. And, and you can almost see the, the order of it as you look at the way that he prays for these things. He, he talks about the hope of his calling, which makes us look back, that we've been called out of, light, uh, or out of darkness into, into light, that we, we want to make sure that our election is, is, is sure, that we belong to God. The riches of the glory of his inheritance, that I'm looking ahead and knowing about this glory that is yet to be revealed. And it's almost like Paul anticipates as we look to this glory that is yet to be revealed, we think, how are we ever going to get there? And it's like an anticipation of that. Paul says we, we need to pray what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. This is not only here. I mean, he prays this over and over throughout the New Testament. In fact, in 2 Peter 1, 3, we, we, we see... Peter saying, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Paul, as he's praying about knowing Christ in Philippians chapter 3, he says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He goes on to say in verses 20 and 21 of Philippians 3 that our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into the conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. It's like Paul is praying, Peter is praying, all throughout the New Testament we see these prayers that it is the power, it is in the knowledge of him that we understand that it is God who is working. It's God who is going to complete this work. And that's what we should be encouraged about this morning, is God is the one who's doing this. I, I think sometimes I was talking to a, a young man earlier in the week, and he was telling me about uh, he had been called by uh, a search committee. And this person had been training for ministry for a while, and he was, he was telling me, about this search committee, and he's, he, he's a young man. He said, I, you know, I, I just don't know that I can, that I'm ready for such a thing as this. And, and he said that, he started talking about the previous pastor that was there. The previous pastor had been there 25 plus years, I think is what he said. And he said, you know, they're, they, they're going to be looking for somebody with, you know, a lot of experience. He said, I just don't have that. And he started, he started talking about all these different things that he was lacking in and describing the situation and the people there. And immediately I, I, I said to him, I said, you know, you sound like the ten spies. You know, those spies who went over to the promised land. Only jo Joshua and Caleb came back with a, a good report. But the others, as they saw what was going on in the promised land, they looked at it and all they could see was their weakness. All they could see is that they were like grasshoppers in the eyes of these folks. Now, I hadn't thought about that scripture in a while. But what was interesting is that he said, you know, I was just looking at that scripture two days ago, and you're right. Well, what is that? What is, that is the power of God at work in us. When you're prompted to pray, or when you're prompted to, to read the scripture, it is the power of God who is at work in us. God is always at work. We, we pray and we ask God for his power, but the reality is that God has given us his power. What we need to recognize and acknowledge is that he's already at work in us. And this power will not be overcome. This power, in fact, will overcome. And this power will complete this work in us. Certainly, there are numerous scriptures that speak about this, but the emphasis that I want to 
put this morning is that this work of creation, and, and most of us here would understand that, that the Scripture very clearly speaks about a, a work that begins in us that is outside of ourselves. You must be born again is the language of John chapter 3. And anybody who has studied that scripture and that passage knows that to be born again is to be born from above. That speaks of something that happens outside of ourselves. Uh, to be a new creation in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. To be a new creation is not a making decision to follow Christ. It, it is not uh, believing something about Christ. To be a new creation speaks of the work that God has done in us, that he's made us a new creation. Now, this is what he talks about in uh, chapter 2 when he talks about that we are God's workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, Ephesians 2.10 says. So here's what I want to emphasize this morning, that our work of salvation, now we have things to do. We have, uh, certainly we ought to uh, be about pursuing God and the things of God. But what I want to encourage you with this morning is that just as our salvation began with God, our salvation will be completed with God. And let me put it this way. I think I've said this before. But God is more committed to your sanctification than you are. He is going to make you and conform you to the image of Christ. He will accomplish that. Now, one day that's going to be fully realized and perfected. When we see him, we will be like him, as John chapter 3 makes clear. But God, who's began this work in us, is working to conform us to the image of Christ, and we need to cooperate in that work. And we need to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God at work in our lives. And if we don't, and we continue to fail when the Holy Spirit prompts us to get up and spend time in, in prayer with God, and we when the Holy Spirit begins to prompt us to serve Him, or when the Holy Spirit begins to prompt us to, to study the Scriptures, we might find ourselves on a sickbed. We might find ourselves where we can't seem like we can't make ends meet. We, we might find ourselves where God is bringing about chastisement in our life, and He does so, for the purpose of bringing us back to him. Now, don't hear me saying that if you're sick, you're suffering, you're having difficulty, that that means that you're out of the will of God. In fact, like Job, you may be in the very center of the will of God. And God's using those things, even in the midst of the faithful, to bring you and conform you to the image of of a son. Praise be to his glory that this one is going to accomplish that work. Well, this is what he says, that we would know this. He wants us to, to grasp this, to understand this. And then he illustrates this. He, he gives us a demonstration of this. As we think about our own life, we think about being conformed to the image of Christ and almost looks helpless. But he reminds us that this one, verse 20 says, this, speaking of the power and the demonstration of the power of God, he says that which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. I think sometimes we talk about the resurrection and we talk about what it means to be a, a believer in Christ. We talk about the cross and sometimes we miss we miss the glory in that. We miss the, the marvel in that. I'm, I'm telling you that Jesus was dead. And God raised him from the dead. You talk about power. That's an awesome power of God, that God raised him from the dead. You, you think about the death and, and the grave and, and all that tried to restrain him, but nothing could hold him back. Because it's the power of God. And, and, and Paul tells us, gives us this example. You, you want to talk about the power of God at work in your life? It's that same power that brought about Jesus from the dead. 
So don't, don't be mamby-pamby and crying about your problems. Listen, God, who raised Jesus from the dead, is at work in you. He's at work in your life. We need to recognize that and acknowledge that and live in light of that. This same God who raised him from the dead is the Spirit is dwelling and living within us. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit is what he tells us. It's not just that he raised him from the dead, but he seated him in heavenly places. He put him all, of, uh, all he, he's over and, and above all of these different things dominions if you will he says he puts it this way in verse number 21 above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but in the one to come so it's not just that jesus was raised from the dead but to show his power he puts him at his right hand he gives him this place of honor being at the right hand is not only a place of honor, but also speaks of a place of authority. Can, let me just say this, church, because we need to be reminded of what Paul is telling us here, and it's all throughout the New Testament Scripture. I, I know that there's a glory to come, and, and I know that, that this glory has yet been revealed but this scripture teaches us something that we need to be mindful of, that right now Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and all things have been put under his feet. It's not that he will reign, he is reigning. He's reigning. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. This Christ Jesus, and the book of Hebrews really goes into detail about this. I mean, this is not an angel. This is one who is greater than the angels. And this is one who is greater than the devils, the demons. This one has been placed at the right hand of the Father, and all of those are under his feet. And if we are in Christ Jesus as a joint heir, then all of that is under our feet as well. That we are in Christ, and that this power of God is at work in us, and we're reigning with Christ. And, and again, I, I know that there's yet to be a glory revealed, but we need to be mindful that he is right now ruling and reigning and bringing all things into subjection to himself, and all things will be put under his feet. And our role, part of our role, is to proclaim that Christ is king, that he is reigning, and to take dominion of, of, of what he already owns. He, he, he is already ruling and reigning over this world. We need to go and claim it in the name of Jesus. How do we do that? By submitting to his rule and reign. By teaching all that he commanded by sharing the gospel, by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is what Paul is saying. You want to talk about power? God raised him from the dead. You want to talk about power? Every other power is under his feet. He says in verse 22, and he put all things in subjection under his feet. Notice how that's placed. That's in the past tense. He put all things in subjection under his feet. They have been put under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And this last phrase is one that has perplexed the church for a while. What does it mean? We certainly understand what it means that Christ is the head and we are the body. But in terms of power, what we should see this is that the fullness of him who fills all in all, there's two different ways that this is interpreted. We'll call it the right way and the wrong way, but there's two different ways that it's been interpreted. 
I'll leave out some of the names of those who fall into different places. But one, and, and a lot of prominent scholars have this idea, that Christ is the head, and that in, in a sense that Christ is incomplete without the body. And so the body fulfills the ministry of Jesus on the earth. That's, we are the hands and feet of Jesus is kind of how that is the scene. But I don't think that's what you see in the Scripture. I don't, I don't think that's what the Scripture teaches. In fact, what I, what I think what the Scripture teaches here and elsewhere is that in the context is that Christ who is the head, that is this power that is in Christ, has been given to all of those who are in him in the body. So he feels all. So this power that is in him is the power in which has been filled in us. We are his body. We do carry out his work here on earth. But it's not that he is in need of us, but quite the contrary, that the body needs the head. It is us who is looking to him the one who has filled us, and this power that is work, at work in us will accomplish what God has intended it to do. What am I saying? I'm saying this, that as I look at this, that if God raised Jesus from the dead, that he will raise us from the dead. That if he raised the head, then certainly he will raise the body. And what we see in this passage of Scripture is that God is the one who is at work in us. It is this power of God that is work in us. And we should know this and we should understand who our God is and how powerful this God is that we serve. I was reading, even right before the service, I was reading in Jude, where he says that, begins that letter by saying to those who are the called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. You just see it everywhere. He ends that letter with a doxology by saying now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. He's able to keep us from stumbling. So as I look at myself and I, I think, how am I going to make it? The only way I'm going to be able to make it is because I'm kept by God. The only way I'm going to be able to make it is because God has begun this work in me, and he will complete it. I want you to turn to John 17. I want to just close out with a couple of verses John 17, this, what has been labeled as the high priestly prayer. And then we'll turn to Romans 8 and close with that passage. But in John 17, just before Jesus goes to the cross, you remember that his disciples, he prays for them. And he prays this prayer, beginning in verse number 11, where he says, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, speaking of his followers. And I come to you, Holy Father. Notice what he says, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. What Jesus says is, I'm the one that kept them. I guarded them. But I'm going to the cross to do what God has intended for him to do. That is to die for his people. And in this passage, one of the things that we gain or glean from this passage is, is that Jesus 
puts the care of his followers in the hands of the Father while he goes to the cross. And here's what I want you to see in this. That if the Son or the Father were not keeping us, that we would perish. Do you understand that? When you think about your own salvation? You, you, sometimes we think, well, you know, I'm... I'm I'm doing my part. <laughs> you, would, you would perish. The, the enemy would come in and devour you in a moment. The only hope that you have of your salvation is that Christ is keeping you. The Father is keeping you. John... Uh, Romans chapter 8, I want to close with this and just remind us of this truth that Paul gives us. And it's a reminder that if God weren't keeping us, we would perish. But Paul ends Romans 8 by talking about this love of God. And he says, I'm convinced, verse 38, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. Wait a minute. Do you see what Paul has been praying for that we would understand in Ephesians? And he points to the Resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that not even death could hold him, and not even death, as Paul is talking about here, will be able to keep us from being in the love of God. There's nothing that would separate us from him. These dominions, these powers, these angels, these principalities, they can't keep us from the love of God. Verse 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's remarkable. This one who is keeping us, this one who has saved us, this one who has loved us with an everlasting love, and nothing can separate us from that love in Christ Jesus. We are His. We belong to Him. And He desires that we would know Him more intimately. So that these things might bring joy to our heart. That as we know him and we see who he is and we understand all that he's accomplished. What a great and glorious God that we serve. Do you see why I'm encouraged about the power of God? Because it's this power. <laughs> it's this power that is at work in us. And if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, then this work of the power of God's Spirit is at work in you. Will you stand with me for prayer? Oh, glorious Father, we are overwhelmed by these truths. And I dare say that we have failed to even begin to grasp the greatness of your power at work in us. But I pray, Lord, that through the preaching of your word this morning, that you, through your Holy Spirit, have wet our appetites. Lord, that we would come to you and spend time with you and to know you more deeper, more intimately. Even as Paul prayed that we would know the power of your resurrection. 
and even the fellowship of your sufferings. Lord, that we would know Christ. That we would know the true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. This is our prayer, Lord. Draw us unto yourself. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.